Hi, I'm Deborah Poff from Mount St. Vincent University. Uh, we have with us today a feminist theologian from um, Boston. She's going to talk to us about patriarchy as a conceptual trap. Now that's a very provocative uh, title for, uh, for your book. Uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that we live in a society that feminists have called patriarchy. And by patriarchy, they mean a slanted society, a society that's just like this, in which what men do is highly valued and what women do is not very highly valued. For example, Margaret Mead found as she went from culture to culture that uh, why it didn't matter what was done in from tribe to tribe. It only mattered who did it. If in one tribe weaving was done, it was... Uh, by men, it was very highly valued, and if it was done by women, it was not highly valued. If in an adjoining culture it was done by women, it was not highly valued uh, because it was done by women. So patriarchy is a slanted society, and my contention is that a slanted society functions as a conceptual trap for us. It provides a, a room in which we go, and we can't imagine any other way of living and it functions very much like the black hole of the universe in which we fall down into that pit of those assumptions about the world and we literally can't see any other, other way of imagining ourselves. Uh, could you s sort of elaborate on, on what is entailed in this trap? Or? Okay, well two other things that I talk about in the book, and I'm sure there are others, but two that I have psyched out so far is the first uh, conceptual error or trap is the illusion that patriarchy has that the male is the only human and that when you've looked at what the male of a species thinks and does, you've looked at what all humans do. And you can see this in male generic language. We talk about he, we talk about mankind. We History is literally his story of what men have done in wars and battles and political skirmishes, etc. And in all our disciplines, um, men have been what we have looked at. And so one error that patriarchy makes is the illusion that somehow or other the only thing to look at, the only person to pay attention to is the male half of the species. But see, I think the reason this is a trap is if you consider the possibility that, that in evolution through the ages there is information encoded in both halves of the species. And one of the problems of patriarchy is that the information that is encoded in the female half of the species drops down to invisibility and silence, and we only hear about what the male of the species knows about reality. The problem is that what the male of the species knows about reality is only a part of the picture and is now leading us toward nuclear war, toward environmental, you know, doing ourselves in on the planet, environmental degradation. And that's what the male knows has, you know, only has brought us to. And I'm convinced that the knowledge that is encoded in the female of the species is necessary to, to balance that equation to survive on the planet. Now that's conceptual error number one. Conceptual error number two is the way we have imaged ourselves on the planet because we've imaged ourselves as a part of a big triangle in which God as the spirit is on top and then men and then women below that and then children below adults and then animals below people. We call them subhuman species and plants below that and nature on the bottom and our Judeo-Christian tradition has told us that God gave man dominion over all of this or in evolutionary terms we've convinced ourselves that this is the evolutionary pyramid and we began here in the primeval soup and we went up the pyramid and as the most highly evolved species or as God-given dominion we can do whatever we want to the rest of the planet and I'm convinced and the evidence I think is piling up that as long as we go on doing that we are going to destroy ourselves on the planet so I think those are two two large conceptual errors that patriarchy the slant of society has done for us right if I could address the first one, yes. um, some people who would be considered sexist would like what you're saying, it sounds like, so perhaps you should elaborate. You're saying men and women are qualitatively different. Well, I think we are alike in that we both have two arms and two legs and a torso and a head. But I think that in certain ways we are qualitatively different. We have different hormones in our male and female bodies. It is very different going through life with a vagina, it's going through life with a male penis, and our genitals are not only accidentally or, or superficially different, but I think they really condition the way we think and feel about a lot of things. For example, 
women are really afraid of being raped. Men are not afraid of being raped unless they're put into prison. I think men are afraid of being impotent. And I think you can look at male consciousness in all kinds of ways, including our foreign policy, and see that the fear of impotence stalks the male consciousness in a way that you or I are not afraid of being impotent. So I think, you know, we have different bodies, we have different hormones. I think the latest research shows that we use our brains differently. It appears that males have con uh, ability to, to use both either, either the left or the right side of the brain, but not both sides together, and that women have the capacity to use both sides of the brain at the same time. And then we are socialized differently. And so I think there is real, um, there is real knowledge, perhaps body knowledge, perhaps, no, for example, it is only the female of the species that realizes that in any given moment of sexual encounter, she has to worry about what happens nine months later. Only women have that body knowledge. To step back into my professional capacity as a person trained in technology who taught at the MIT Sloan School of Management, I know that one of the problems our contemporary culture has is that we do not think about the long-term future. Now, isn't it interesting that the male who never has to worry about the long-term consequences of sexual decisions is the one who does not think about the long-term future, and the woman who does have to worry about that and who, in addition, rears the children who are, who are the long-term future are the ones who are really concerned about the long-term future. We are not allowed in the culture to express our concern for the long-term future, and yet male critiques of culture say, my God, we're going to hell in a bucket because we're not worried about the long-term future. Right. So the, the important difference in what you're saying is the sexist, the sexist would say men and women are different and women's traits are, are inferior. very are inferior. And what you're and I'm suggesting saying men and women are different and that, you know, in a way viva la différence, even more than that, that we desperately need the different way of looking at reality that indeed I think women's experience brings to us. Because one of the exciting things, and I can't talk about this very much in, because our interview is so short, but the Carol Gilligan's work at Harvard uh, shows is that women, for example, do moral reasoning differently. The evidence is clear in relationship to nuclear energy even, that women are more concerned about risk than men. And yet, once again, one of the problems we're dealing with is a technology gone mad in which we're not concerned about the risk of toxic waste or we're doing to the environment the risk of nuclear war. We love, males love their technology. They're not concerned about risk. Women are concerned about risk. And once again, the human species needs that Instead of being silent and invisible, it needs to be brought up here so that it can balance. In other words, I'm not talking about women ruling the world. I'm talking about getting off men ruling the world so that the human species don't rule the world but live in harmony in, with the interrelated rest of creation. Right. Does right. that make sense? That <laughs> makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> in a world where patriarchy is a conceptual trap, and from your book, it seems like it's systemic, right? It's our language, it's our religion, right, it's our right, myths. Right. Um, how are we going to get men and many women to recognize the importance of women's lived experience and their knowledge? And their well, I think perhaps one of the ways we can do it is to go back and ask ourselves, where did this come from in the history of the human species and why, which I have asked myself. Because I think some feminists have had a too easy um, explanation of patriarchy and epic men are evil, and I don't believe that. I know too many nice men. I'm married to one for 27 years. Okay, if men are not evil, then where did this slanted society come from? It seems to me if you examine human history, it is logical to feel that it came way back in the early history of the human species where men did not understand their role in human reproduction. And as they looked at women's ability to produce children almost magically out of their bodies, and they did not have that ability, they had the freedom from childbearing and child rearing and taking care of children to create culture by sitting around talking about creating mythology, which we find in, you know, in patriarchal stories and stuff. And, and in that mythology that they created, the culture they created, very logically they did it to reassure themselves, to make themselves by being up here on this land feel better about themselves. Now, that is no longer where we are in the history of the world. Men do not have to have a slanted society, I don't think, in order to feel good about themselves. So I think perhaps one of the ways is to understand where this came from and they don't need it in quite the way they did before. Secondly, to understand how perilous is their situation on the planet and that, it, that some of the ways men think about the world writ large are so dangerous to the world, including the nuclear arms race. And then I would hope that um, 
uh, a lot of the male writers, um, and I think there's an increasing number of them, who are beginning to say, men's lives would be fuller if we got off this kick of having to be, you know, fearless, fosdick at all moment, and, you know, never be vulnerable, and never have fear, and never have any emotions, and never be able to cry. You know, we're killing ourselves with ulcers, with heart disease and stuff. It would really be better if, you know, if I were able to free my emotions up if I were able to emancipate the women in my life so I didn't have to, to only bear the economic burden of, of doing all the bringing in the money. Really, the world, I would feel better about my life, I think many men are beginning to say. Now, not all. Many men, I think, are very still very clutch. They feel if they are not in control, if they are not above women, if they are not above the planet, their, their lives will fall into pieces. And I can only say I think that it's the most secure men around who feel most relaxed about themselves. And, um, and I'm hoping that um, through a process of consciousness raising, we can, I find as I talk to men about patriarchy as a conceptual trap, it has never really occurred to them that they live in what I've called Adam's place, namely a world in which Adam the male has named everything, thought everything from the male point of view. And they say, oh, yes, my God, you're probably right. I never thought about that before. And, and it's a whole new way of thinking about what women want. It's not that women want more wages, more this, more that. It's that women want to step out of a thought world so totally done from the male point of view, and they want to add a thought world done from the woman's point of view, and they want to combine these so indeed we will live in a co-ed thought world and behave accordingly. And it's such a startling thought. It's, and I don't think most women realize that men don't realize that they live in Adam's world. It simply never occurred to them. That's the way the world has always been. And for many women also, that's the way the world has always been. Right, right. Do you think, um, I know you all also have a number of environmental concerns. Yeah. Do you think we're going to be able to last long enough to produce this new vision, this new I world? I think that's anybody's guess. I am, would not promise that to anybody because I think our, our environmental situation is very perilous. I think we have maybe 10 to 20 years to save ourselves on this planet. And uh, really at the Che, the founder of the Club of Rome, who has died in the last year or two, said he thought we had 10 more years um, in which time we could make decisions that would put us on the right roads rather than the wrong roads. And beyond that, those 10 year period, all our options would be negative. And we would have gone past the positive roads that we could have gone off on. And he may be right. And, and I'm talking about changing the thinking of humankind, not only about male and female, but about our dominion on the planet in this pyramid that goes way back, and certainly Western civilization. It's a huge task, and I'm not sure we are going to be able to do it in time, just the way I'm not sure that people involved in peacemaking are going to be able to change our, the way we function on the planet in relationship to nuclear arms before we blow ourselves up by the computer era. Right. Right. But I think the most you can do is to keep trying. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether we'll make it a minute before or a minute after or not at all. But I function not on the basis of, of optimism in terms of predicting that we can, but on the basis of what I would call a theological category of hope, namely that it is a possibility of turning our conscience around. We have mediums like television in which I mean, I've heard friends say that in the history of the environmental movement, they, they went to, to, um, to England one year, and, they, and before they left, the word environment and ecology, nobody knew. And when they came back, everyone in the culture knew it. Right. And, and television provides us with a possibility of enormous consciousness change very, very quickly for enormous numbers of people, as indeed I think has happened in relationship to the women's movement and male and female roles. And it's one of the, you know, the, the few ways in which I think we may save ourselves if we do indeed save ourselves. Right, right. I have a high view of television. <laughs> <laughs> one of the few intellectuals I know has a high view of television. So at least there's possibilities. Can I ask you one other thing yeah. uh, that's a bit different? Um, we were talking about it earlier, about the fear that women have of feminism. I remember reading an article a couple yeah. years ago that said, I don't know what it means, just don't call me one. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think underlies that fear of, of alliance with basically I think it's equality? Male backlash. I think it's clear that patriarchy is defending itself from the feminist critique by saying feminists are awful, shrill, rabid, bra burning. I mean, I can't find a woman who remembers a bra being burned. I mean, I think that's really straight p male PR. And what we've done is frighten many women and indeed the next generation of women not into giving up their feminist goals. They all want to have a liberated uh, marriage. They want their, uh, their husbands to help them rear their children. They all plan to have children and have their careers, you know. They have, they're very liberated about their lives. They just are afraid of being called feminists. But I think that's a real problem for us as women because 
it would be like blacks saying um, that they really thought that Martin Luther King was a rat fink. I mean, no right. black in the civil rights movement would do that either then or now. And yet women have a way of being turned by the male backlash of patriarchal culture against their own movement and saying, oh, yuck, I don't want to be like that terrible Jermaine Greer or that terrible Gloria Steinem, you know. And yet they are, they want to live on the basis of the consciousness raising, the, you know, the pay raises, the educational opportunities, et cetera, that those women have made possible. Right, right. Um, I'm going to ask you a terrible question for last, last yeah. question. Um, your current work is on reconceptualizing God. Yeah. How do you think we reconceptualize God? I think we try to exorcise what a woman is called, you know, that male face in the sky. And I'm not personally in favor of substituting a female face in the sky. I think we need to reconceptualize into a myriad of non-human images of God, like rock, like waterfall, like rainbow, like cloud, like web, like pulse. And I'll be talking about these tonight. That's terrific. I've been talking with Elizabeth Dodson Gray. I hope some of you will be attending her lecture tonight. And I hope you'll also stay tuned next month when we'll be talking with Thelma McCormick on women and civil liberties. Thank you.